Welcome to Williamsburg Baptist Church's worship service on June 28, 2020. While we're not able to gather in person, with thanks to God and talented church members, we are able to gather virtually. Welcome to all who can participate and worship with us. There are no new announcements this Sunday, but I'd like to remind you that the Reflections devotional guides can be picked up from the fellowship hall or you can call the church office and ask Kim to send you one in the mail. Also, feedback on our services would be appreciated and can be provided by writing comments below the video. Today, we're happy to welcome back Reverend Max Blaylock to our virtual pulpit. Max is the campus minister for the Wesley Foundation at the College of William Mary, the collegiate ministry of the United Methodist Church. He blessed us with very powerful sermons the past two weeks. If you've not heard them, I encourage you to do so. Please join me in our call to worship. We come today heavy in heart for all the difficulties our world, nation, and community face. May God grant us mercy and provide comfort. We come knowing there has been and continues to be injustice against many. May God grant us wisdom to recognize injustice and the wherewithal to fight against it. We come knowing we often have eyes that cannot see how our actions are impacting others. May God open our eyes to fully see all of God's people and treat them equally. May God's grace, mercy, and love be showered on all creation. And may we take to heart the words of Paul to the Philippians in chapter four, verse eight. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things.
Good morning, my friends. It's that time again. It's that time for this week's children's sermon. Please gather around your streaming device or computer and join us for this week's talk with children. Ba -ba -ba. Hi. Hi, Gabe and Jake. I hope everybody had a great week this week. Jacob even lost a new tooth. Look at that big hole in his mouth. So have Gabe brought something with us today. It's a building block set. Have you ever put together a big building block set like this before? I oh. have. <laughs> Over the years, the kids and I have built lots of these building sets, and we've had a lot of fun building them. We have have built figures, helicopters, boats, cars, houses, and even landscapes for Minecraft. So some of these sets have a lot of parts and are very difficult to build, like this one. This one, it has a thousand and four pieces. But no matter how difficult it is, there's one thing that comes in each one of these sets so that you can make your building like what's in the picture. Do you um, know what it is? Is it instructions? That's right, instructions. Suppose I gave you this Lego kit right here. Do you think you'd be able to put it together? No. By instructions. That's right, with instructions, it might take a little bit of time. You might need a little bit of help, but you could probably do it with the instructions. Well, what if I gave you some instructions that told you that I wanted you to build me a boat that was 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high? Do you think you could do it? <laughs> You probably say, no way, that's bigger than my house. I couldn't build a boat that big. Well, that's exactly what happened to a man named Noah. Now, I know you've heard the story before, but let's see if you hear something new that you didn't hear the first time. One day, God looked down on the world that he had created and saw how mean and evil the people had become. It broke God's heart to see the people were acting that way. I'm sorry I made them, God said. I'll get rid of them all. But God saw that Noah was different. God saw that Noah was a good man, so he decided that Noah and his family would be spared. God told Noah about his plan to send a great flood to destroy everything on the earth. He told Noah to build a boat called an ark. God told Noah exactly how to build it. Then, Noah was told that after he built the ark to fill it with animals. Do you know what kind of animals? Um, two of every kind. That's right. It was two of every kind. Noah obeyed God. He built the boat, and then he put two of every kind of animal into it. Then Noah and his family entered the ark, and God shut the door. Soon the rain began to fall. The raindrops made little puddles then bigger puddles, then the big puddles became streams and rivers, then mighty seas. Soon the whole earth was covered with water. The ark tossed up and down on the waves, but Noah, his family, and all the animals were safe. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights until the rain finally stopped. It took many days for the floodwaters to go down. When it finally did, Noah and his family and all of the animals left the ark. Noah thanked God for keeping them safe. God had a plan for Noah's life because he was faithful and obeyed God. Noah and his family were saved. God has a plan for your life too. God has told us about the plan for us in the Bible. Listen to what is said. I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. If we obey God's word, his plan for us, will, our lives, will be successful too. Let's pray. Dear God, sometimes it seems as if a job is way too big for us. Help us remember that if we put trust in you, anything is possible, even when the instructions seem like they are really hard too. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We want to thank you very much for joining us this week. We hope you have a wonderful and safe week, and you have a great 4th of July. 
We look forward to seeing you again here next week. Until then, bye. Bye. As we move into our time of prayer, I'd like to remind us to keep in mind all those that have been mentioned earlier in the service, as well as other joys and concerns that we have. The pastoral prayer that I'm going to share with us today is uh, not my words. Uh, it's actually a prayer that was co-written by a uh, white woman out in Seattle and an African-American pastor from North Carolina. Uh, and I think is, um, is entitled A Prayer for Justice and A Prayer for a Pandemic. We'll pray this prayer together and then we will close by us all uh, praying the Lord's Prayer together. Let us pray. Dear God, may we come to know justice and compassion and repent for those who have let the viruses of greed and lies make this situation worse. May we come to know pandemic spread through the wounds and fissures of our society and seek to close them. May those who've gone along with the lies just to please narcissism break free and tell the truth. May we who are merely inconvenienced remember those whose lives are at stake. May we who have no risk factors remember those most vulnerable. May we have the necessary righteous indignation in this moment to fight for transformation. May we who have the luxury of working from home remember those who must choose between preserving their health or making their rent. May we who have the flexibility to care for our children when their schools are closed, remember those who have no option. May we who have to cancel our trips, remember those who have no safe place to go. May we who are losing our margin money in the tumult of the economic market, remember those who have no margins at all. May we who settle in for a quarantine at home remember those who have no home. As fear grips our country, may we be the kind of people who stand up and who refuse to lay down. May we choose love. Dear God, during this time when we cannot physically wrap our arms around each other, let us yet find ways to be the loving embrace of God for all our neighbors. And let us recognize that we cannot give up in this moment. And no matter what it takes, let it at least be written down in history that with our last breaths, we fought for the world that ought to be, just as Jesus did. And as Jesus' disciples, let us now pray the prayer that he first taught his disciples praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, WBC family and friends. Before you listen to the upcoming anthem, I want to take a moment to introduce you to the WBC virtual choir, who will share with you the beautiful prayer, I Need Thee Every Hour, arranged by John Nesbeck. At this point, I am going to guess that when the peace begins, you may find yourself wondering how all these unfamiliar people have showed up to sing for our service and where they came from. Welcome to the virtual choir universe. As a result of connections made with fellow participants in composer Eric Whitaker's latest virtual choir project, Sing Gently, which will premiere on July 21st, we find ourselves today welcoming 18 guest singers from 11 different states and four foreign countries 
who graciously volunteer, volunteered to join our church's own little quintet of singers to bring you this lovely piece of music. We are so grateful to all of them for helping to make this project possible. Of course, I must point out that none of this could have happened without the amazing talent and technical skills of our wonderful organist and choir director, Tim Brewster. He not only accompanied and conducted the piece, but used his sound mixing and video production skills to create what you're about to see and hear. Bravo, Tim. WBC is blessed to have you. Now, as you prepare to experience this beautiful music, I would like to close with these relevant verses from the hymn, When in our music, God is glorified. When in our music, God is glorified, and adoration leaves no room for pride, it is as though the whole creation cried, Alleluia. How often, making music, we have found a new dimension in the world of sound, as worship moved us to a more profound Alleluia. Let every instrument be tuned for praise. Let all rejoice who have a voice to raise. And may God give us faith to sing always. Hallelujah. Amen.
Join me in the offertory prayer. Before we go to God with prayer, I want to remind us all that the work of the church is ongoing. If you're able, you can make an offering online or by mailing a check to the church office. Now pray with me. Dear God, for the blessings of this and all our days, we thank you. You have given us all that we have, the very breath of our bodies and all that sustains us. May we listen to your call for us to live justly and open-hearted. Help us to go forth in trust and give of ourselves, both financially and with our time and talents. Whether we have little or much, help us to always live open-handed and to find our greatest joys in following you and serving you and with thanks for the gift of your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God all creatures here below. Praise God above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 31. Hear the word of the Lord. As Jesus continued down the road, a man ran up, knelt before him, and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to obtain eternal life? Jesus replied, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God. You know the commandments. Don't commit murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't give false testimony. Don't cheat. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he responded, I've kept all of these things since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him carefully and loved him. And he said, You're lacking one thing. Go and sell what you own and give the money to the poor. Then you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But the man was dismayed at the statement and went away saddened because he had many possessions. Looking around, Jesus said to his disciples, It will be very hard for the wealthy to enter God's kingdom. His words startled the disciples, so Jesus told them again, Children, it's difficult to enter God's kingdom. It's easier for a camel to squeeze through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter God's kingdom. They were shocked even more and said to each other, Well, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them carefully and said, It's impossible with human beings but not with God. All things are possible for God. Peter said to him, Look, we've left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, I assure you that anyone who has left house, brothers, sisters, mother, father, children, or farms because of me and because of the good news will receive 100 times as much now in this life. Houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and farms with harassment, and in the coming age, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. I'm Rev. Max Blaylock, the United Methodist Campus Minister appointed to William & Mary at Wesley Campus Ministry. It's great to be back with y'all again for the third Sunday in a row. Uh, hold on, we got one more. So I hope that the, uh, the sermons have been meaningful for y'all. I know they haven't been easy, so if you are uh, here for the third one in a row, I commend you. Thank you for your grace and for your faith. Let us go to God in prayer. Loving God, thank you so much for this time together. Thank you so much for continuing to have faith in us. 
Thank you for continuing to challenge us, to encourage us, to inspire us through music, through scripture, even through preaching. God, open our hearts and minds and souls and ears and eyes to be moved by you this morning. Help us, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The scripture that we read today uh, for many of us, and I know for me, is a familiar scripture. I like it a lot. I think about it a lot. Um, but in preparing for this sermon this week and reading it again, um, I realized something about me, and maybe it might be true for you, um, and about Jesus. And about how Jesus' vision and my vision, um, they're not the same. And that's a problem for me. And it might be a problem for you and maybe uh, we can at least name the problem today. Because the part of the scripture I want to focus on is... Um, when Peter says to Jesus, we've left everything for you. You've already said that it's easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. But we've left everything for you. And Jesus says these words to Peter and to us. I assure you, that anyone who has left house, brothers, sisters, mother, father, children, or farms because of me and because of the good news will receive 100 times as much now in this life, houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and farms with harassment, and in the coming age, eternal life. Now, when I've preached this before, I talk about what is, I say, what is Jesus talking about? Now, of course, y'all were there. I'm here. This is on tape. We can't have this dialogue the way it normally happened, but we'll try um, to do something different. What is Jesus talking about when Jesus says, in this life, if you follow me, that you will receive a hundred times anything that you've lost of family, of kin, of houses, of farms, you'll receive a hundred times in this life. What is he talking about? Is Jesus like transfigured into not the son of God with Elijah and Moses beside him, but instead a TV preacher preaching prosperity theology that if you just name it and claim it, you're going to get a hundred times of houses and farms and family. All you want, because if you just have enough faith, you're going to get it. I don't think that's what Jesus is doing. So what's he talking about? Well, I think he's talking about the community of faith. That for all of us who follow Jesus, that even if that following of Jesus causes us to lose friends and family and homes, that it gets multiplied because now we're part of a much wider community. I believe that's what Jesus is talking about. And I want to ask you, when you think of the community of faith, when you think about the people who are friends and who are family and whose homes that you know are just like your home, And who, as, as we say in our family, those people who are chosen family, that we know we would do anything for them and they would do anything for us. And we think about that vision of community and faith and family and kin and friends. What does that community look like? Who are the people? Because when I was preparing this sermon... And thinking about it again, I realized something about my vision for that community. When I think of that, you'll get hundreds more houses and mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers and children and farms and harassments if you follow me. 
My community is an all-white community. Because i got to tell you, I have a really hard time imagining my family being welcomed into the house of a family who's not white. Not because folks who are not white wouldn't welcome us in. I mean, I could name several people right off the top of my head who would, but we've never done it. I have a hard time imagining a family of blacks coming into our house and spending time in our house and viewing them as family and community like Jesus is talking about because the best of my knowledge, that has never happened. My vision isn't Jesus' vision because my vision's all white. And Jesus' vision for the family of God sure as hell isn't. So where's the disconnect? What's what's my problem? My problem is, is that I've been raised to follow Jesus who does think that the community of faith is for me at least, is pretty much all white. Now, there are other communities of faith that can be completely non-white. They can be black, they can be Hispanic, they can be whatever. Um, But that's not my community. Because that's what my communities of faith and my schools and my neighborhoods and my family have taught me over and over and over again that the folks who I'm really connected with, they're all white. Is it the same for you? For those of us who who are listening who aren't white, I know it's not. Because y'all are a lot closer to Jesus, a dark-skinned Middle Eastern man, than us white folks are. But for us white folks, that's been the message. We've been following a Jesus who pretty much embraces white supremacy. Because it's hard for us to have a vision that's not white. When I was growing up, I was a huge contemporary Christian music person. I was one of those persons who tried when I was a middle schooler and teenager and even into my college years to only listen to contemporary Christian music. But I never fully succeeded because... Other music was just so much better and so good. But there was some contemporary Christian music that was good too. Um, But I don't listen to contemporary Christian music at all anymore. Um, I might listen to some of that old stuff on a once in a blue moon, but that's it. But here in the last few weeks, there's one song that's been back in my brain that I've been thinking about. And it's by a contemporary Christian musician named Michael Card, who is still around. And, um, and it's a song that, uh, that he got in trouble for in some Christian circles for even writing it. And I want to share at least some of it with you today. I'm not going to sing it, so you're welcome. But the, the first part of the song goes, it seems I've imagined him all of my life as the wisest of all of mankind. But if God's holy wisdom is foolish to men, then he must have seemed out of his mind. For even his family said he was mad, and the priest said a demon's to blame. For God in the form of this angry young man could not have seemed perfectly sane. When we in our foolishness thought, when we, in our foolishness thought we were wise, He played the fool and he opened our eyes. When we in our violence believed we were strong, he became a victim to show we were wrong. 
And so we follow God's own fool, for only the foolish can tell. Believe the unbelievable, come be a fool as well. That's the first half of the song. And I want to admit to you that I changed um, the lyrics there in the middle. Uh, it used to say, uh, it originally says, it still says, when we in our weakness believed we were strong, he became helpless to show we were wrong. I changed it because I think today when we in our violence believed we were strong, he became a victim to show we were wrong. And it's about vision. It's about a Jesus who is far beyond our white supremacist Jesus. And our white communities and our white families and our white churches and our white neighborhoods. I changed the lyrics to say when we in our violence believed we were strong, he became a victim to show we were wrong. Because as James Cone put it in the title of his book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, that if we can't come to grips with the fact that the black men and women who are being crucified right before our eyes are the closest thing that we have to Jesus in our society at the moment than we're not seeing with the eyes of Jesus. If we can't read the account or watch the video of George Floyd being slowly choked to death, yelling, Mama! Mama! and not realize that that's our son yelling for his mother, that's our brother yelling for his mother, that that's our kin being choked to death for eight minutes and 41 seconds, then we don't have the vision of Jesus. Because Jesus tells us that there is no other there's no them. There's only us. Because that's the only way we end up with hundreds of houses and mothers and brothers and children and sisters and farms and harassments is if we have a vision that explodes white supremacy and embraces a vision of Jesus. In other translations of the Bible, it doesn't say harassments, it says persecutions. Because Jesus knows if you follow that kind of a vision, you're going to lose some people. But you're going to gain some people too. Because Jesus was looking at his journey that was about to turn toward Jerusalem and the cross with clear eyes and a clear vision. And he knew what was coming for his disciples too. And it's what's coming for us if we dare. Because as the words of the, uh, of the song continue, to come lose your life for a carpenter's son, for a madman who died for a dream, and you'll have the faith his first followers had. And you'll feel the weight of the beam. So surrender the hunger to say you must know. And the courage to say I believe. For the power of paradox opens your eyes. And blinds those who say they can see. So we follow God's own fool. For only the foolish can tell. Believe the unbelievable and come be a fool as well. I don't want to be a fool. I want to be right. I want to be in charge. 
I want to be an authority. But if I'm going to follow Jesus, and if you're going to follow Jesus, we're going to follow Jesus together. I'm going to have to give up a lot of this. Give up our vision. And ask God to replace it with a new one. Give up our authority and sit at the feet of our black and brown kin and family and learn from them. Because the world is not as we see it. God is not as we imagine. And the brown-skinned Middle Eastern man that we claim to follow is leading us and the world into a reality that is almost beyond our imagining. I'll say it is beyond our imagining. But we get glimpses. We get glimpses when you see white and black and brown and gay and straight and trans and bi and immigrants and citizens and undocumented and documented, all joining together throughout this country and saying black lives matter. That's a glimpse of the kingdom. The invitation is out there. Jesus is out there. We're going to follow that fool or not. Amen. And now, please receive the benediction. No matter how weak or frightened we may feel, we each have gifts that can make a difference in this world. In this coming week, may we do at least one thing to support the broken, to welcome the stranger, to celebrate what is worthy, to do the work of justice and love. May we be strong, May we be connected, and may each day, may we act so that we and the world may be a little more whole. In the name of God the Father, 
Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in power. Amen.